Good, Good morning. I'm going to yell at you a little bit because uh, we only have one mic this morning, but uh, <laughs> pretty good crowd for being so cold out. And I'm surprised at you guys, especially you. I did, you know. Hey. <laughs> I can leave. <laughs> no, we don't want you to do that. We don't want you to do that. Uh, I appreciate all of you guys that were praying for my wife last week. She had uh, back surgery, and I thank you for that, and everything's coming out so far. It looks really good, so I appreciate it. Uh, we're really fortunate this morning. We have uh, El Fade, and if I told you everything about him, we he wouldn't have time to speak. So I'll just give you a couple of the highlights. He was raised in Saudi Arabia as a Muslim. Uh, at a young age, he almost joined Osama bin Laden. And uh, but things have changed since then. He came to uh, the United States to uh, he got his degree in engineering. He's also a graduate of, of the Phoenix Seminary. Uh, He's, he's founder of uh, CIRA, which is the Center for Islamic Research and Awareness. He's written a number of books. He's host of a radio show, Let Us Reason, Christian Muslim. Uh, I mean, he's, he's done everything. And I think you guys are really going to appreciate it. He asked me what's, what, what I wanted to speak on. And I said... Uh, you just choose the topic because every time he has spoke, it's just it's wonderful. So, uh, El Fadi, come on up and uh, give us some of your wisdom. I noticed, I noticed today you have notes. Usually, you walk in, I say, "Where's your notes?" and he says, "Right here." Yeah, I just wanted to give you <laughs> that as a reminder. Thank you so much. Thank you really for this invite. I know it's been a while and I know COVID put a, a dent on our you know, teachings. I used to come in at least on average of twice a year. So I'm thankful that we are resuming this. Um, indeed, I did ask uh, Dave, I said, you know, what would you like me to talk about? And his answer was, you choose. I'm like, that's a wrong answer. Because <laughs> I got plenty of stuff to talk about. I really debated um, whether I should talk about the usual updates about what's going on in the Middle East. And I felt like maybe we've done that a few times, maybe next time. But um, I wanted to talk maybe about a topic and, and I think you wanted me to just stay right there. Right here is fine, yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about a topic that is, um, you know, maybe we're not familiar with a topic that is new to all of us called cancel culture. So that was a joke, of course, uh, yeah. Um, you know, in the past, I would have said, I don't really care about these kind of issues. I don't want to worry about these kind of issues, but I hear about it over and over. And as someone that I teach at college also, um, I'm becoming more and more uh, mindful of those kind of issues because it seems that if you do not sometimes stand up for what is true, you will be walked all over. And as Christians, we have to find a balance between loving and embracing our neighbors and at the same time, sharing the truth in love. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. Why is it important? Because you hear every day now, every day, there is a story about someone who was being chastised or ridiculed on the social media platforms uh, simply because they tried to stand up for what is true. For instance, there is this professor at West Point back in 2018 was fired simply because he has a trans, uh, transgender student and he was calling the student by name, respecting the student, did not really object to having that student, but the fact that he didn't use the right pronoun that the student wanted him to use and refused to do that actually lost his job. So that's just a classic example of what might happen. You have a CEO of a company and his name is John Gibson, CEO of Tripwire. He too 
celebrated the decision by the Supreme Court to uh, basically um, uphold life and overturn Wade versus Roe, he too lost his job within two days of making a tweet just celebrating the goodness of God. That's all he says. You know, he is praising God for protecting life. Of course, you cannot, you know, say things like this anymore. If you were to go on and talk about killing the innocent, then everybody will be celebrating that with you. In fact, people want to have right to kill. During that time, there were basically people who were demonstrating the fact that they lost their right to kill. Now think about it for a second here. I've been preaching from Ezekiel for the last year. It seems like 10 years now, because that book is absolutely so deep, it requires you to unearth anything and everything that you could to be able to make sense of a book that was written 2,700 years ago. And here is what I discovered. The book of Ezekiel talks about America. It talks about our culture. It talks about the decay that we are faced with today. Yes. And folks, I have to say this. Unless you as believers, all of us as Christians and believers, are willing to stand up for what is true, I am not seeing anything positive coming our way. In fact, Ezekiel was talking to the people of God who were in exile already and let them know why are they in Babylon. And here's how it unfolded, by the way. It was Micah about 120 years uh, a year earlier, along with Isaiah. They warned the people that trouble is coming their way. And they listed to them why trouble is coming their way. Here is an example of what Isaiah told them. You will find this in Isaiah chapter 5, by the way, and here is a crash course in Isaiah, okay? Isaiah has 66 books. How many books in the Bible we have? And I'm not going to really argue about the other books, okay? We're just talking New Testament, Old Testament, 66 books. Isaiah is divided almost exactly the same way. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah represents the past. And the last 27 talk about the future. And the last few of those talk almost about the second coming of Christ, the millennial age, and everything else that is taking place. The first five chapters of Isaiah were an indictment by God to his people. Let them know why the Babylonians are coming. That's pretty much what it was. The Babylonians are coming because you've done this, 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 and all of it was listed in five chapters. Here's an example of what they have done in chapter five. You call evil good and good evil, okay? You embrace darkness over light, and you despise light over darkness. You put bitterness for sweet and sweet for bitterness. Does this sound familiar to you? Yeah. I mean, every day when I flip channels, and especially one of my favorite channels that has like three initials, basically CNN, they share the truth with you all the time. <laughs> all the time. In fact, when you flip to the other channel, you wonder which universe you're living in, this or that. We're becoming basically so indoctrinated to lies and fabricated news and truth that we're not be, uh, able to see the, the light anymore. And I say this, by the way, as a former Muslim who lived in Saudi Arabia, where the media was controlled by the government. You are told what the government wants you to hear. And guess what? There is a lot of people over there who are disillusioned about a lot of things. They blame the CIA for everything that happens in the world. Come to think of it, maybe it is true. I don't know. <laughs> but all I have to say is that their reality over there is completely different than your reality and mine. And I'm starting to notice that young generations are living exactly in the same indoctrinated state. They're not willing to heed to the truth anymore. They want to hear someone else. They want others to feed them whatever they want to hear. And these days, 
I do a lot of videos, by the way. I was doing videos that will take an hour. That was back in 2016. Then I was told you need to shorten them. So I started to do videos that take about 40 minutes. And I was told that you need to shorten them. So I'm doing videos that take 25 minutes. And they told me they're long. Start to do 15, long. I'm starting to do 10. Now they have cures that are less than a minute. What does that tell you about our attention span? We have no time to ever research anything anymore. I'm talking about the young generation. And we have a responsibility to try to help this generation understand the difference between what is right and what is wrong. And many times, unfortunately, they are left to hear it from the wrong sources. Universities these days, in general, are a hub for disaster. I'm really sorry to say this. You go to any university these days and you begin to see programs that make no sense whatsoever. A course on happiness, really. <laughs> Just read the Constitution, he'll be happy. <laughs> you invest all this money at prestigious universities to learn how to be happy. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that is going around and no one says anything. When you don't draw the line, by the way, people will cross lines upon lines upon lines because no one is standing up against those ideas. And I get it why we, we can't stand up because we're being canceled. You're being called radical. Um, I laugh, uh, you know, I laugh when I hear that, you know, because you have conservative views, you're called radical. I'm like, you wanna know radical? See my life when I was in Saudi, that's radical right there. Radical when I wanna go to Afghanistan and die, that's radical, okay? Radical is not standing up just to say what you are supposed to say or at least express your view. When I came to this country, I was so excited that I finally made it to America. And I have to tell you, I didn't taste freedom until 2000 when I swore my allegiance to the United States and became a citizen. Only that day, I knew what freedom would look like. Ask immigrants, by the way, in this country. They will give you a completely different image and picture about what's going on in this country. Us who come from those backgrounds are very concerned. I'm not here really to rain on your parade. I'm not here to be the bearer of bad news, but I, lately I have been the bearer of bad news because I want people to realize this nation is going down the drain unless something is done. As believers, we're not here to fight. We're here to proclaim. We're here to share truth. And that's not an easy task anymore, unfortunately. Now, was cancel culture in the Bible? Is it something new? Are we the first to face backlash for standing for the truth? Of course not. Absolutely not. I mean, starting from, let's go all the way into the days of Abraham. You have Joseph who was sold to the traders. They took him to Egypt. And then he was elevated all the way to become the second in command. And then you flip the page from Genesis 15 to Exodus 1. And it tells you there was a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph anymore. He was so concerned about the people of God that he enslaved them. Right there, you have the people of God being canceled completely, even though they contributed to the economy of Pharaoh and Egypt. They were there to work and to help their families and do what was right, not just for themselves, but also for the nation where they live. If you want to know how much they loved Egypt, just Look at what happened in the wilderness. They kept complaining and whining all the time to Moses about want to go back to Egypt. Moses ran out of cheese. I mean, they kept whining the whole time. They wanted to go back to Egypt. Why? They loved Egypt. They loved everything about Egypt. Obviously, they didn't realize they were slaves in Egypt. So they were canceled right there. What about the Israelites in general? at the days of 
uh, you know, Moses. Moses sets them free. God sent Moses to deliver them, took them all the way to the promised land. And then a few hundred years later, the Israelites themselves began to cancel their own prophets. Those who were sharing the truth with them, those who are proclaiming truth to them, those who were reminding them of what they are doing wrong were being canceled by the people of God. It took 900 years before God finally says, enough is enough. I'm sending you to Babylon. And that leads me now back again to Ezekiel. Isaiah warned them. Micah warned them. And then came Jeremiah. Jeremiah is like, the Babylonians are right here. They ignored. Ezekiel was called by God. And Ezekiel is saying, not only the Babylonians are here, you are in Babylon. How do you like it right now? And they are still in denial. You know why? They were fake news prophets that were telling them, you're going to be there in Babylon two years max. And God was telling them, you know what? Enjoy the next seven years. Get married, have children, have your children get married, establish yourself, have businesses, buy land, do whatever you want. You ain't coming back in two years. And they still did not get it. What am I saying? News is extremely powerful that it can definitely numb your brain because you only want to hear what is good that tickles your ear. You do not want to hear anything that alarms you. Anything that triggers fear or concern. Now, we shouldn't be going around, of course, causing people to be afraid. But you know what? We're getting to a point to where people need to begin to think about the consequences. Decisions have consequences. And the decisions that are being made lately, unfortunately, have serious consequences on the future of our nation. You have young generations who are being fed lies. They are the future leaders of this country. If you think China won't take over this country by sending balloons, just watch. They will take over this country by sending balloons. They're telling us, I don't even have to set a foot on the ground. I'll take over. And that's my biggest fear and concern, that our nation will be taken by adversaries. You have Iran doing things that wouldn't have dared to do just two years ago, okay? Just two years ago. Amazing how time changes. You have China who is invading our space and acting like there is nothing wrong. You have Russia who is taking over countries right now and they feel like they can get away with it. They can do it. And what's next? We are on the radar. How do we know this? Because we have people from China crossing the southern border that is very secure, by the way, okay? Extremely secure. I've never seen anything like this. There isn't a nation on the face of this earth that have a hole in its border and yet claim that it is secure. We're becoming a laughing stock to the nations. You think Al Qaeda is not going to take advantage of this? You think ISIS is not going to take advantage of this? You think Russia is not going to take advantage of this? I mean, the list can go on and on and on. There are sleeper cells that are coming in groups now. Of course they're going to take advantage of this hole because they know it's only a limited time until maybe they know they're smart. Maybe there is a next administration that will close that loophole. Let's take advantage of this right now. So we have a lot of work, by the way, to do. Our work is cut out for us, for sure. So what do we do? What do we do in the face of these kind of problems? Jesus was canceled. The apostles were canceled. The Israelites were canceled. And many, many other righteous people were canceled. John the Baptist was beheaded just because he dared to say the truth to the king. Well, one of the things that we can do I want to make sure I'm sensitive to our time, is that we remain faithful. We remain faithful to the truth. Despite what the backlash might be, we have to accept the fact that 
the true worth standing for. That's what the Apostle Peter and John did. They were captured by the Pharisees and the temple guard and warned not to preach in Jesus' name. They were imprisoned and told not to preach in Jesus' name. They were captured again and flogged and told not to preach in Jesus' name. They were captured first, preaching publicly. By the time they were flogged, they started to preach publicly and privately. It's almost like they're telling the authority, we ain't stopping. Why? Because they knew that only the truth will set people free. What I'm saying is this, folks. I hope you will never, ever experience persecution. I know what persecution is like. And even my persecution doesn't even come close to those who are in the Middle East and other places where they're being imprisoned and killed for their faith. But I'm afraid that persecution is coming and coming so quick to a neighborhood near us. And we're going to have to stand up for the truth and be faithful to the message. Another thing that we have to learn from our Lord, from God, is to be patient. Peter reminded his hearers that the patience of the Lord is salvation. They were, by the way, he was talking to people who were in exile. He was talking to people who are fed up from the Roman persecution, to people who are wondering, where is God? And he says, you know, God looks at a bigger picture than just you and I. There are lost souls that deserve to be saved. What I'm saying is, maybe we ought to focus our attention on spreading the truth and the gospel and let God do what God does best. It is not for us, by the way, to lash back in a negative way and try to give the fuel to the other side to claim that we are radicals, that we are haters, that we are people that do not like our neighbors. I mean, it's funny how all of a sudden, everybody says that Jesus would not spend millions of dollars on ads if you were in a Super Bowl. I'm like, really? When was the last time you even studied Jesus or learned about him? But that's how the enemy of the gospel works. That's how Satan works. Our fight, by the way, is not with flesh and blood. Let's put it in perspective. Jesus looked at Peter when Peter denied the crucifixion and says, get behind me, Satan. He didn't say get behind me, Peter. Jesus put it in perspective. There is a demonic force behind all of these strange ideologies. And unless we're willing to take on these demonic forces by the power of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we don't stand a chance. We do not stand a chance. What I'm saying is we need to really put things back into their own perspective. If the early church looked at us today, what would they say? They're going to say, oh man, you guys are really persecuted. Or are they going to look at it and say, come on guys, you want to know what persecution is? Here's what persecution was for the early church, the first two centuries. The Romans knew that Jesus told his followers that you are the light of the world, that they would light up Christians on posts. Literally. Now that's persecution. They were thrown in the arenas where lions would eat them up. That's persecution. They would burn people on a stick for anything and everything. That's persecution. We got it made, by the way. The fact that I tell Siri to call for me while I'm driving, yeah, I got it made. You know, so what I'm saying is that we may have to begin to rethink our strategies that is it about me? I always remind myself of this. Is it about me or about my children and my grandchildren and the next generation? Maybe the next time I'm gonna vote, I'm going to ask myself this question, am I voting for me or for them? You see, when we start thinking about them, I believe we'll start making some huge impact. I am thankful, I want to share some positives, 
that a lot of people are taking children now to Christian schools and they're doing homeschooling. That is great. These are the next generation now. It is wonderful. We just need to be patient for about 18 years. And then we'll see what happens. If you can just handle fire for 18 years, you are going to see miraculous things happening. But people are paying attention. Even non-believers are beginning to realize things are getting way out of control. Okay. Big time. But we have to voice our opposition to these things by sharing the truth. That's all we can do, by the way. This is the only weapon we have. But the truth, the word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. This is how we can counter back the things that are being thrown at us. Not to mention, of course, love. I know that it is hard for us to think about love, but here is, I love what Francis Schaeffer says. He says, the mark of a Christian are three things. Loving one another, loving your neighbor as yourself. Notice I tell my students, it is easy to love your neighbor, but do you love your neighbor as yourself? Big difference between the two. And finally, love your enemies. You know that that was the verse that brought me down to my knees and I accepted Christ because of that verse. It is not that easy to love those that hate you, those that want to persecute you, those that want to inflict harm on you. But you know what? Jesus loved them and says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. It is not easy. And notice Jesus didn't say love my enemies. He says love your enemies. He got it covered. He died for them. Question is, are we willing to love them? I know, folks, it's not easy. I mean, believe me, I'm, I'm the first to admit that sometimes my blood pressure goes up when I hear things like this. Sometimes I feel like maybe I'm not doing enough. And then the Holy Spirit, also known as my wife, will have to calm me down. Okay? <laughs> you always have to remind me of certain things. It is normal for us as human beings, really, to react in such a way, but I'm so thankful for the Word of God that reminds us at the end of the day. There was people, Jesus said, he came to seek and to save. Special love, right there. That was team C, uh, SEAL Team 1, okay? He came to seek and to rescue, to set the captives free. I asked this question yesterday of some of my students, and I said, do you remember when Jesus went to jail and set captives free? Because that's really what the prophecy in Isaiah 61 says. That the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to do the following, and one of it is to go and set the captives free, the prisoners free. As if it's only one incident in any of the gospel accounts where Jesus went to jail. In fact, John the Baptist took an issue about this. And says, I am in jail, and I know what Isaiah says. Are you the one, or should we look for another one? Jesus came to set the captives to Satan free, the captives to sin free. No philosophy in the world can defeat and overturn these ridiculous ideas that we read about every day. But only the power of God and the gospel and turn hearts around by the renewing of our mind, the daily feed from the Word of God, trusting that the Holy Spirit will convict people in their hearts by spreading seeds, watering seeds, and trusting that God will bring growth to those seeds. Only the power of the gospel will overturn things like this, which leads me to discipleship. It is extremely important for us, and I'm thankful that you are regularly attending studies like this. My hope is that we also pour in our heart into the younger generation and begin to find ways to feed them the truth and help them grow on solid foundations. Because one day, they will be the leaders of the future, and we want godly leaders. And by the way, here's the beauty about the Bible. Read the Bible cover to cover, and you are going to amazingly discover the following. 
God is not about numbers. He uses remnants only to make amazing movements in the world. My goodness, he only used 12, and you and I are the product of that. He used the remnant that returned from exile, 55,000 to be exact. They returned from exile out of the millions that were in Babylon. He only used Moses and Aaron to set the captive free. So many stories in the Bible to show that only the few will get the job done. What I'm saying is, it is okay that we pour our heart into a handful of young generation that is thirsty and hungry for the truth. And you'll see how God can use them in a powerful way to overturn what is taking place in our culture. This is really all I wanted to share. This is what the Lord put in my heart. And I hope, you know, that it was a well worth it message for you. But with that in mind, we have some time that I can entertain any of your questions, whether related to this or something else. Yes, sir. What's up? Uh, you have children? I do. I have three. My oldest served in the Marines with the Special Forces. I'm so proud of him. And he just gave me the best gift ever, a granddaughter. <laughs> and then I have a daughter and a son. Yes. Do they, uh, do they observe the same condition you see in America right now? Amen. Amen. All of my children, by the grace of God, they are disturbed by what is happening. And of course, my oldest son is so disturbed that he wants, even though he's getting a degree in, uh, in the medical field, he wants to become a uh, border patrol. And I kind of like lose my hair every time he talks about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have any question for me? Yes, sir. I just wanted to go back into the Bible so we can get it. What I found when the social justice was going on, excuse me if I have a little trouble talking, and I dug into what it means to love your neighbor and love your enemy. And what I came across in Luke, to start out with what was Jesus' purpose, when he came here to Luke 12, 49, we're being sold by, uh, I won't label it, like I was going to label it with progressive evangelicals, but they, they want peace and civility and all that. And I just read this. It says, Jesus is his words. I have come to bring fire on the earth. And how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism that under go, meaning John the Baptist was here, he was hoping this would already be ready. He didn't come to Pete for peace. He came to, he talks about families of five or three against two. He's talking about our favorite Karl Marx word, creative destruction. We hear about all this technology. The other thing I, I went through, and I just wanted to, you know, it's been on my heart for years past three years, is when we define love, you know, we use the word love, and it's like, okay, love over here, now we got to go to work, and I got to get stuff done, and I got, but you know, oh yeah, we feel this love. I think he's talking about uh, loving your neighbor than the enemy, it's agape love, and agape love is not empathy. Empathy is the antichrist language, is developed in uh, Germany is a 20th century word. Empathy is where you go in and jump in the quicksand with that person who's, you know, rioting in the streets or whatever, you know, oh, I feel bad for them, so I'm going to jump in. But agape love is what it's meant to mean. Again, this is my analysis is you get, in a, as a Christian, you get what you need when I help you get what you need. Not what you want, but you need. Christ talks about need and fighting off your wants, giving the desires to your heart, but your desires to your heart are changed when the fruit of the Spirit develops in you. So if we look at, we use the word love, I'm not, as similar to what you said, I'm not concentrating on me or even necessarily my family, but you. If I look at Doug or Tom or whatever, or out in the world, whether you're a Christian or not, I can concentrate on what you need 
because then I get what I need. And that's what is going to change all of this, in my opinion. And we're dealing with wrong, wrong, wrong analysis. In the church, they are more afraid about talking about what to do as a society, i.e. the politics. They're afraid to say that for fear they'll lose their 501c3 certification. I've sat in here, I've sat with the top political guys in here in church that refuse, refuse to say platform, but forget about the person, platform, platform. I, you know, I, an odd background, Jews and Baptists. I ended up going as a kid to Presbyterian Church. When we went through confirmation, we studied John Knox, who developed our whole city as a, a preacher out of Scotland. And that is what the United States government is based on, is what God gave him and passed on. We had a foundation that our kids, we, maybe even in here, don't have a foundation. So anyway, I just, the only words I want is you get what you need as a Christian when I concentrate on getting what you need. That's it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And of course, I mean, I always remind people, friendship evangelism does not save only the gospel saves. In other words, we always love to, you know, help people, be friends with them, uh, because we want them to see Christ in us. That's, that's awesome, but they still need to hear the gospel as well. And then, whether they come to Christ or not, it's not up to me, as long as they know where I stand, as long as they know who is the king that I follow. And, uh, I mean, in, in uh, addition to what John mentioned, you know, Think about the ministry of John the Baptist. John the Baptist went across the Jordan River to the other side. Read about this in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 26. Why do you think the Holy Spirit is telling you John was on the other side of the Jordan River? Who do you think the last guy who came from that side into the Promised Land, also the miniature Garden of Eden, also known as the kingdom or the nucleus of the kingdom. Joshua. What did Joshua do when he crossed the Jordan River on the other side? He didn't walk in hugging people, okay? He walked in fighting those who wants to resist. Now, that was a physical fight. Here, John was talking about the spiritual fight. He wanted people to come to the other side. Acknowledge there's a drone or a balloon up here. <laughs> he wants to, people to acknowledge they're sinners, give themselves in water symbolically, and say, We're cleansing ourselves to do what? Waiting for the king to enter into his kingdom. The first ministry that Jesus has done, and that in gospel in the gospel of Mark, was to defeat demons and Satan, to clean house, to cast him out. Jesus is saying, if I can cast out spiritual demons, you are so easy for me, okay? That's what he's saying. That's the king who came to fight, to liberate people, spiritually. And we need to always think, with that mentality. Of course, I'm from China, the Middle East. We always think about fighting when we're talking to people anyway, okay? We always argue and shake hands and do things like this. And my son, I used to take him with me to the Arab store. And he's like, Dad, why do they always fight everywhere? They go in the Arabic store. I'm like, son, they're talking. They're having normal conversation. <laughs> if they're fighting, you will know that they're fighting. <laughs> Any other uh, comments or questions? Yes, sir. We look at love as a feeling. Jesus looks at love as an action. Right. If we had no voices, would people be able to tell you were Christian? Yeah, that is true. That is true. I so like it's that. the actions of our heart. It's yeah. what do we do with our hands or our feet? Um, you can't beat people into the kingdom, but you can love them into the kingdom. That's true. I come from a, a Jewish background. None of my family are believers. So if I bring Old Testament to them, they may, may what's really sad is they don't even understand that. So they're so far away from their heritage. They're so far away from truth. So I cannot bring biblical verses to them because they feel judged. What I can do is I can show them love through the love of Christ and what he's done in my life. 
to my to my children, to my brothers, to my sister-in-laws, to my nieces, to my nephews. But using biblical words is an is offensive, as I'm sure in your culture growing up. Of course. That pushes people away. So it's not, we can't expect people to meet us where we are. You have to meet them where they are. Ask questions. It's the easiest way to find out where people are at. Says Jesus came, right. meeting people where they are. Speaking of the Jewish heritage, um, I remember a friend of mine who was also a Jewish, um, secular Jew, liberal who thought the Bible was written by men. I'm like, okay, well, we have a lot of talk about it for sure. But uh, he invited me to the Passover meal. And uh, I went there thinking that he is going to really show me how this is celebrated. And he was sitting right here, his father in front of me and his mother. They're all Jews. And he asked me to share the story of Exodus with them. I'm like, now that is really interesting. A guy from Saudi who was a Muslim who hated Jews, and now he loves them because Christ taught me how to love everybody, talking about the story of Exodus to three Jews. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could tell you they were saved because they didn't share the story correctly. So we'll see. Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Question. I understand how love comes into play when you're loving one another, you're loving your neighbor yourself, but and hearing about the conflict and fight and defeating the opposition, what does it practically look like to love your enemy? Well, here's how it looks like. Obviously, we do not want to lash back at them even when they throw insult at us. In other words, don't use their language. Whatever language they use, it doesn't matter. But we consistently share with them why we believe in what we believe and what they mean to the same person we believe in. They need to always hear that. I know they're going to get irritated probably because we are calm and collected and we're focused on our message. We need to be focused and we need to be faithful. If you meet them at their level with the same kind of language or behavior or anything of that nature, then unfortunately we are not distinguishing ourselves. We're not looking different in their eyes. And by the way, people pay attention. They pay a lot of attention to what we do. And they're waiting for you to do the wrong thing to tell you, I thought you're Christian. You see, you do not want to fall into something like that. So that's one of the simplest way of how to uh, do that. If you are involved in social media, I would go, for instance, to their platforms. If you feel like you want to have stone thrown at you, and you go and you just comment on some of the things they're saying, in a logical, in a way that you are reasoned with them. Paul would go to synagogues to reason with people. He wasn't there to yell at them. He was there to engage them in discussions. That's one of the approaches that Jesus also himself was doing. He was in parables and other things. He wanted people to think. Sometimes, out of the crowd, and here, here's what I noticed, by the way, it's true uh, among Muslims, it's true among non-Muslims as well, in our culture, for instance, you have one or two loud voices and everybody else wants to follow them out of fear of being canceled. You have no idea how many people in that group that might embrace the message that you will be sharing with them. All you're doing is you're giving them the opportunity to engage. And that's just, these are some of the simple ways that we could, of course, at the political level, you really want to make sure you go and engage their issues on policies. If you are at the legal level, you want to also go and uh, face and engage those policy so, uh, issues. So we have to be active. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. We cannot turn our back and walk away and expect things to change by themselves. They ain't going to change by themselves. They're getting from bad to worse, actually. Unless there is a light all the time. And Jesus says, I did not take you out of the world, but I left you in the world. Why? For a reason. He wants you to be the salt of the earth. He wants you to rub against them. He wants you to irritate them. By what? By the way you are going to encounter them, behave with them, show love toward them, and at the same time, not compromise. You can always push back and say, I see where you come from, but... Here is why you're wrong. Here is why we should think about this and this and this and this. 
Well, once people start, uh, you know, getting faced with these kind of challenges, they're going to have to make a decision whether I continue engaging you, walk away, or maybe embrace what you believe in. I mean, this is just uh, what comes to mind at the moment. Yes, sir. We hear a lot about agape love, and um, which is the love that comes from God, which is supernatural. It is not something naturally a man can do. It's something that comes only from the Lord. And God calls us to love our enemies. And I know there are a lot of people God calls me to love I don't approve of. I don't like at all. And the Lord, uh, I argue with the Lord often, saying, Lord, how can you, why do you want to love that guy? I don't approve of that person. I don't like that person at all. Thanks, Doc. But God says, I want you to love that person. And one of the problems we have in our culture is we're very success oriented. We think that if we don't win them for Christ, that we're, we're defeated. We feel uh, we missed the mark. And that's because we don't understand obedience and what God's love is. When he says love your enemy, it isn't about winning your enemy. It's about being obedient and love them, share the Lord with them. And whether it's successful or not, is not an issue. The issue is being obedient to the call of God. And uh, it's because our culture is so successful, and particularly uh, most of the people in this room are successful. We uh, have success as a high ideal, and it's not biblical. The biblical worldview is obedience, do what God tells you to do, and leave, leave it with the Lord, even though you're rejected, you may be persecuted, you, people will not think well of you, you've been obedient, and that's it. Amen. Yes, John. I just want to say something to Cole because he's the important group. You know, we've had our, we can do stuff with, with and, and I believe he's in sales and marketing and, and provide financial service. But if you show, you know, the, the old saying, uh, you know, your actions are the opposite. Your actions are so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. When you go after somebody's needs, and they know you're concentrating on their needs, that then helps build your fruit of the spirit. That's coming out of your fruit of the spirit, like the doctor said, like it is supernatural. But you've got to apply that fruit of the spirit. Fruit of the spirit is being fed. You know, the idea of what he uses when he says fruit, that means it's being fed, fed by studying this. But then you'll be in a position, whether it's a work in business, whether it's at the store, you know, our, our friend Schrader used to say, you might need the only Bible that those people see. So you just concentrate on their needs and God will take care of the rest. I think that's what it is. And that's, instead of saying, what can I get this person saved? <laughs> no, it's, what does this person need? Their basic needs. And people observe how you take care of their basic needs here on earth. Say, boy, well, that's different. He stopped asking me about me. He was really concerned. He was, you know, he did what he said he was going to do, all the, the basics. And that flows from the through the spirit in my what? And you can have the greatest business idea in the world, or how you treat the person at the checkout counter at the store. But that application, some of the greatest ideas and technologies and everything done, but it's also a day-to-day mission that we've been given and once we use the word want i want these very people to be sent and that's god warns us against our wants we make it so complicated all we have to do is plant the seed yep. god's going to make it grow mm -hmm. yes sir can you uh, give us some insight and positive input about what you're seeing in young people college students seminary students that gives us hope that there is a remnant from the younger generation that 
towards what we're talking about. From what I'm seeing, that most of my young students, and when I say young, they are 19, 21, 22, that's the age group, they really do not like what's happening. But they don't feel empowered to speak about it publicly because they don't want to get vilified publicly as well. But when you take them one on one, sometimes, I mean, as surprisingly, the other day I brought up the topic of abortion, and I asked, I said, ladies, let me hear you. I mean, I just want to hear what your thinking is about this. I want to be respectful to where you're coming from. Not a single one of them approved of abortion. Not a single one liked this idea. They all acknowledged that there is a life at stake here. To me, that was refreshing. And it apparently, it is the foundation that brought them to this place. They were raised this way, or they attended Bible studies, or at least someone is pouring their hearts into them. Some of them became believers just about a year or two ago. Some grew up in a Christian culture. So it shows the importance of discipleship. It shows the importance of Christian, biblically sound Christian setting. I want to be careful here to say it that way. Uh, so I think that's that's what I'm seeing right now, that these young generations are disturbed what is happening. They're concerned about the culture, but they just need someone to mentor them, someone to be there for them, someone to empower them, someone to give them a platform. So I suggested to uh, one of the department heads, is like, what if once a semester, we invite some of the students and have a panel discussion about a topic that is culturally oriented. They love the idea. Last time we talked about social media out of all things. You have no idea how many of these young generations are disturbed by how social media is used in the negative rather than we capitalize on its positives. I was impression, really, to hear young generations who love social media platforms in all forms, if you wish, they are voicing out their concern. That's important for us to take it from here now and find ways to empower them, to take them as they can communicate with people their age better than I can do, or people their age will be willing to listen to them than they will listen to me. So that's what we can do. Uh, maybe one more? Yes, sir. You know, thank you for that coming to our Bible study group. And what I fight with is that we talk about this in Bible study groups, or other classes and stuff like that. But when we go to church, um, back to what the gentleman said earlier about this our tax status, we don't get into the congregation. We don't lead them at the leader of the church telling how we should go out and support Christian groups that fight the social bad stories that we've said and I fight with that. Uh, as, how, how do we get the church leaders mm -hmm. promote this that we hear like we hear? Uh, First Baptist Church of Tempe, you're welcome there. We <laughs> voice it out all the time. In fact, just Google me and you'll see that we do not hide. I agree with you. Only a handful of churches are willing to go that route. For whatever reason, I don't want to judge the reason behind it. It could be concern about tax status. It could be that the pastor is getting pushbacks from the congregation. Who knows? But we need to be that powerful sounding board because a lot of people are watching and listening, not just those who are in a few, by the way. These days, it's new cameras, live streaming. So we can speak to the masses. So I agree. And we need to really, maybe, maybe we need to invite the pastors and give them platform to begin to flush out the reasons behind it and maybe find a way to empower them to do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, anyone else before we? Yeah, once a month yeah. over at Dream City Church on Cactus and uh, Cave Creek, Turning Point USA, Charlie Kerr mm -hmm. yeah. has a a forum and then he invites speakers in and uh, right before the election he had Pete Hegseth up on stage with him and they were talking about the education of America and their feeling is because Turning Point is now bringing curriculum into Dream City churches around the country that teach Christian values 
um, there was a young girl because they had question and answer. She was in GCU, Grand, uh, Grand Canyon, uh, not Grand Canyon, uh, Grand, Grand, yeah. Grand, Grand, Grand Canyon. Canyon. Yeah. And she walked up to the mic and she said, what do I do about a professor who failed me because I wrote a, my, uh, I don't know whether it's a thesis or my, my uh, final on um, pro-life and he failed me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So they were a little taken aback. And it was really interesting because he said, don't go to the leadership of the school, go to the donors, the people that are giving the money to that school. I think they would like to hear about these things. So you can get a forum. And he said, I'll actually present this so you can get a forum in front of these individuals. Their feeling is, is that the kids that have been indoctrinated at the college level that are so far gone are far gone. It's the younger ones, the five, the six, the seven-year-olds that we have to get a hold of to re-indoctrinate exactly. them into Christian beliefs as opposed to those that are screaming at the top of their lungs and they don't know what they're fighting for. They just want to be heard. So I have a 27-year-old and their concerns are so much different than ours in the world because they look at us as ruining their world, their future. They're being priced out of the real estate market for rentals and everything else. Where is their future? So to try to reach somebody like that, it's really difficult um, because they don't see God. They see the depravity of man. That's all they see. Powerful. Yeah, my son is 26 years old, and he's also struggling to find a place where he can live. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> How's your expensive? <laughs> Before we take off here, I, I this is Tim Horn. I'm coming in on Zoom. I would like to ask a question of you. That, that some that I'm seeing now is a new thing. I've been an activist, a political activist, and a Christian all my life. So what we're seeing now is something new, and we're seeing it in the district where you're sitting right now, uh, the political district called the Legislative District of the Republican Party. And uh, I know there's at least one other person that's in this meeting that, that will know what I'm talking about. But this is a new thing I've not seen. I'd like to have your thinking about it. So there's currently a group of people, I would have to call them radical right, okay? They're, they want and push Christian principles, but they do not act like Christians. You know, so they're stepping it to, be, to do what? They're using all the tactics of Saul Alinsky. Most of you hopefully know who that is and what he did to help move the left into what they are today. And... They're using those same principles of disruption, um, despicable action. Although they're calling themselves Christians, they shout anybody down. They won't follow rules. They refuse to allow meetings to take place. They overwhelm, intimidate, bully. And, and yet they're thinking they're doing the correct thing. They're acting like the left, but pushing the principles uh, of what we would think are Christian principles. Have you heard of such a thing? Have you seen anything like this happening anywhere else? And if so, what, what can we do about it? How do we counsel these people? In fact, I just got a text, a, a, I'm sorry, a call from one of them right now uh, as, as we're in this meeting who wanted to talk to me. But I'm, I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts about this? Does it sound familiar to you? It does. I mean, there's something called national Christianity, where we become more on the national side versus basically being on the biblical side. Jesus did not come to teach us to carry uh, clubs and, and swords to go and fight. No, that's not what I mean by standing up for the truth. In fact, you're absolutely correct. If we do something like this, uh, the other side going to look at us and say, so what's the difference? I mean, uh, what, what, what message are you bringing? You're doing exactly what we're doing. And 
young generation, like Howard mentioned, are going to look at both sides and say, well, you both are the same. You know, I'm not seeing anything that distinguishes your message from their message. So uh, you're absolutely correct. That's not what we ought to do. Uh, standing up for the truth doesn't mean fighting, doesn't mean disrupting, doesn't mean bullying. In fact, I told my son, who is special forces with the Marine, by the way, I said, son, if that other side, the radical right, wins power one day, you and I are going to be in deep trouble because we will be looked down upon because we are not people that belong to the nation. So he kind of got the message right away that we are not to promote the other side also when it goes to that extreme. What we are to do is to promote biblical principles. Now, if you have a relationship with them to where you can talk heart to heart, you need to really enlighten these people and say, that's not what Jesus thought. Show me where Jesus ever advocated the approach that you want to take. And if they don't want to listen, you might want to begin to bring awareness about these things because we shouldn't also empower any of these sides. That's just me. I mean, I would not like to empower, uh, you know, groups or sides that are divisive. We need to unite, not divide. That's pretty much what comes to my mind, uh, Tim. Well, I like what you're saying, but I, I, this is very important and it's immediate. It's, it's, a, it's happening right now. I'm wondering if I couldn't impose on you to maybe talk to you a little bit more about this <clears throat> and maybe get some additional assistance. I'm in a position where I, I can make a difference, and I'm going to be remiss if I don't take a good shot at it. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you can reach out to me through Dave uh, uh, if you want, uh, or at least ask them to give me your contact, and I'll be more than happy to reach out to you. And please, yeah, I, I would like that. I'll try to get hold of you, and Dave, Dave has my number and stuff. Okay. He'll give it to you. Thank you for your consideration. Absolutely. Thank you. And be, for being here today. You're welcome. It's an honor. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everybody. everybody.